Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown. Across the table is Matthew Stockton. Hello, Matthew. I just learned your nickname. What? Oh, no. Yeah, we won't talk about that. It was a, it was very brief that I had that nickname. So anyway, and we're not going to tell people what it was. People can take guesses. Actually, there's a couple of people in the Umberyard who might know. So. It's actually quite sweet. Yeah, well, whatever. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Anaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. A non-away away game. On Friday, February 20th, 1976, while on vacation in Florida, OPP Corporal Donald R. Irwin, 39, a father of three from Kitchener, Ontario, went on a ride-along with his good friend, Florida State Trooper Philip Black, also 39 years old. Irwin was in civilian clothing and unarmed. At around 7.15 a.m., they checked an old Camaro parked in a rest area on I-95 north of Pompano Beach, Florida. Moments later, both officers were dead, and the five people who had been in the Camaro had fled in Black's cruiser. The suspects, Walter Norman Rhodes Jr., 26, Jesse Joseph Teferro, 29, Sonia Sonny Jacobs, 28, Teferro's wife, and two children, Jacobs' nine-year-old son Eric, and the couple's 10-month-old daughter, Christina, were apprehended at a roadblock after having kidnapped another man and stolen his Cadillac from a retirement home after abandoning Black's cruiser. Rhodes' life was spared as he pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against the other two. Jacobs and Teferro were both sentenced to die in Florida's electric chair, but was justice really served? The case eventually unraveled, but not before Teferro had his date with Old Sparky in 1990. You're listening to Dark Poutine episode 223, Blurred Justice, The Murders of Corporal Irwin and Trooper Black. This complicated and sad case was suggested by listener Trish Dubkowski in our case suggestion thread in our Facebook group, The Umbriard. To join thousands of other good eggs and to make your own case suggestion, please go to facebook.com slash groups slash Yumberyard and join. When a police officer dies in the line of duty, there's always a lot of media coverage. But when an off-duty officer from another country, unarmed and on a ride-along with a friend, happens to be one of the victims, the volume of coverage gets turned up to 11. This is as it was with the murders of Corporal Irwin and Trooper Black. Corporal Donald R. Irwin, by all accounts, was a decent cop. He was said to be quiet, helpful, and a friendly man. He'd never had to unholster his revolver in the 18 years since joining the Ontario Provincial Police in 1958. He served at headquarters in Toronto and was a constable for some years at the Peterborough Detachment before coming to Kitchener on promotion in 1969. The Irwins, Donald and his wife Barbara, and their three teenage children, Janice, 17, Judy, 16, and Brian, 14, 
had all come for a visit to the sunnier climes of Florida, as many Canadians do each winter. They'd done it for years prior, meeting the blacks on one of those trips. They'd arrived this year on February 7, 1976, and were planning to return home to Kitchener on February 21st, as Donald had to be back on shift on February 22nd. Did your parents ever go down to Florida? Oh my gosh, did they ever? Yeah, snowbirds is what we're called, yeah? Yep, snowbirds. Uh, my folks went to uh, Panama City Beach, and I think that's in the Florida panhandle, but we did go to St. Petersburg yep. Beach yeah. when we were kids. Wow. And then to, of course, Orlando. Yeah. And Tampa. Yeah, a lot of a lot of us do. So I, I had a place in Miami for a while. My mom and her husband rented every winter for a long time, up until COVID. Mm -hmm. And I was reading uh, Susan Harper is a Council General of Canada in Miami. Mm -hmm. And on her webpage, she, she's saying that on average, every year three three and a half million Canadians visit. Mm -hmm. um, but listen to this: Canadians own an astounding fifty billion dollars worth of property in in Florida. In Florida? And which means Canadians contribute almost six hundred million dollars to in property taxes every year. Wow. Yeah, I mean it's huge. I mean half of Canada practically goes down to Florida in the winter. So Florida should be another province then. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, sure. I'm sure that they'd go along with that, especially yeah, with the uh, probably not the insanity that's going on there. Well, there's lots of craziness, Mike, but I've always had such a nice time in Florida. Mm -hmm. You always hear these, you know, the the joke, the the Florida man headlines. Sure, but I've always just met really nice people and had a great time in Florida. Well, so have I. But yeah. you, you know why we hear those headlines is because Florida has what's called the Sunshine Law, which allows reporters to report on things and get information that isn't available in a lot of other oh, states. So it's not that it's worse. It's just that people, like you, they can report it. That's right. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, so people think Florida is nuts, but uh, it's not. It's not more nuts than anywhere else that <laughs> any of us live. <laughs> the Irwin family had had another great visit, staying with their friends, Philip Black, his wife, and their six-year-old son, Christian. Philip, a former Special Forces Marine paratrooper and diver, had been with the Florida State Police for nine years. He was part of the 32nd recruiting class in Tallahassee from August 2nd to October 25th, 1967. He had since been stationed in Key West and Fort Lauderdale, where he was in February 1976. Philip doted on his little boy, spending as much time with the youngster as he could between shifts and on his days off. Many times, Christian and Philip would take off with the family's camper on father and son camping excursions, sometimes into the Everglades. Black had also bought his son a horse, and the boy was learning to ride at the hobby farm that Philip was developing. Philip was a regular at the local church. He had a great sense of humor and was involved in Boy Scouts. Some neighbors weren't even aware and would have never guessed that Philip Black was a cop until they'd seen him in uniform. He was a good-looking guy with an easy smile. A service station attendant at Black's local gas station was one of these people. He told Fort Lauderdale News that often cops had a certain swagger that gave them away, but not Philip. According to an article in that paper, quote, the attendant said, Listen, you know what kind of guy he was? He used to come here all the time for gas, and when it rained, he'd yell out for me to stay inside the station, that he'd pump his own gas, end quote. Philip was known for keeping a level head in potentially dangerous situations. A man had pulled a gun on him during a 1974 traffic stop. Philip had managed to get that person to put his firearm away without incident. Philip Black was a good egg. So was Donald Irwin. He wanted to see how policing was done in Florida. He loved being a cop, so a ride along with Philip Black had been organized for the morning before the Irwins were to leave and fly home. Donald could see no better way to cap off a fantastic visit than to spend the day with his pal as he drove the highways around Broward County. At around 7.15 a.m., Trooper Black noticed the green 1968 Chevy Camaro parked at the northeast end of the rest stop on the northbound side of the 48th Street overpass of I-95. He noted some damage to the front end of the car and thought perhaps it had been involved in some kind of accident. Black decided to check out the Camaro and walk toward it, as Irwin, in civilian clothes, hung back. As Black approached, 
the trooper noticed that there were five occupants sleeping in the car. Two men, later identified as Walter Rhodes, the driver, and Jesse Joseph Teferro, the passenger, they were dozing in the front seat. The woman, later determined to be Sonia Sonny Jacobs and her two children, were sleeping in the back. Trooper Black noticed a 9mm pistol inside the car. Black carefully reached into the car and snatched the gun, which woke Rhodes. Black then ordered Rhodes to get out of the car and asked to see his identification. Rhodes claimed he had no ID. At this point, he ordered Rhodes to stay put in front of the Camaro and return to his cruiser where he ran a radio check on Rhodes and the gun. Black then returned to the car and ordered Teferro out of the car as well. Teferro refused at first, claiming he'd done nothing. Black repeated his order for Teferro to exit by way of the passenger door, but Teferro claimed it was broken and would not open. Teferro then exited through the driver's door, and he and Black began to scuffle as Black tried to gain control of Teferro at the hood of his cruiser. Accounts differ as to what happened next. According to the Fort Lauderdale News, some witnesses claim that the first of what sounded like five or six gunshots came from the back seat where Sonia and her children were. One of the witnesses, Nelson Thibault, who had traveled to Florida from Maine, was just 30 feet away when the shooting started. He'd seen Black and Irwin approach the car, but had looked away just as the violence broke out. From the Fort Lauderdale News, quote, Suddenly five or six shots rang out, Thibault said. When he looked again in the direction of the Camaro, Black lay on his back in a pool of blood, his head partway under the front wheel of the green car, and his wide-brimmed hat lying beside him. Irwin who was dressed in civilian clothes, lay nearby. Both men were dead, end quote. I can't believe how quickly that escalated. Mm -hmm. And these two men lost their lives like that fast. It's really quite horrifying. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll learn later, both of these guys were on parole. Mm -hmm. And both of them had been overheard saying, allegedly, that they were not going to go back to jail ever. Okay. So. Then maybe don't have guns on you. Yeah. The Fort Lauderdale News article continued, quote, Another witness, Richard N. Personage, 32, of Toronto, was just waking up in his camper. He, too, heard the burst of gunfire. He said they sounded like the shots were coming from guns of a different caliber. And one burst, he said, was very rapid, as if fired by an automatic pistol, end quote. There were two other witnesses as well. From a later chart outlining elements of the case, quote, Two truck drivers watched the drama unfold from a distance of 150 to 200 feet away. Pierce Hyman and Robert McKenzie. Neither truck driver could say who the shooter was, but both said in their statements to the police that Teferro was pinned over the hood of the car during all the shots. Hyman's story changed slightly only after several discussions with the police. He then said Teferro might have gotten up off the hood of the car before the shooting stopped but almost when it was over. Both truck drivers saw slightly different things, the most significant being where Walter Rhodes was standing. Hyman said Rhodes was always standing in front of the car. Mackenzie said Rhodes moved to the rear of the car as the shots were fired. Mackenzie's statement was very significant because the shooter, according to later ballistics evidence, had to have shot from the rear of the car. The reason Hyman thought Rhodes never moved from the front of the car is because Mackenzie moved his truck forward to the exit, blocking Hyman's view of the scene at the exact time Rhodes moved to the back of the car. End quote. Sounds complicated. Yes, but that's the way eyewitness testimony usually goes. Rhodes and Jacobs, Teferro, and the children all piled into Black's cruiser, and they fled the scene. Another trooper arrived minutes later to find both Black and Irwin laying in pools of their own blood. He called for an ambulance but knew that both men were deceased as Trooper Black had been fatally shot twice in the neck and had two more bullet wounds in his body. Corporal Irwin had taken two rounds as well, one in the chest and one in the head. The suspects in the stolen police cruiser sped north on I-95 and turned off the highway at Hillsborough Boulevard. No doubt they'd been monitoring the radio traffic on the cruiser's police band radio and had heard that other cops were searching along the interstate for Black's missing patrol car. The cruiser stuck out like a sore thumb, so they decided that they would get another vehicle, Pronto. 
They ended up a quarter mile from the highway in Deerfield Beach at a gated retirement condominium complex. Leonard Levinson, president of the condo strata, saw the cop car pull up in front of the building and went outside to inquire of who he presumed to be the police what they were doing at Sleepy Century Village. Levinson was surprised when he was met by two men, a woman, two children, and the gun pointed at him by Rhodes. A neighbor watched as Levinson was forced into the back seat of his own car at gunpoint, an orange 1975 Cadillac, which the fugitives had commandeered. The caddy sped off with Rhodes at the wheel. Poor Mr. Levinson. Right? Like, I, No, I have like huge heart for Mr. Levinson. Yeah. I, that's not how you think your Friday morning's going to start. No. It, it, you, you know, you, you're you, in a retirement community on a sunny Friday morning. This is probably about, well, it's all started at 7.30, so this is probably like 8.30 in the morning. And he's like standing out there, sees a police car come in, and all of a sudden he's like kidnapped in, in his caddy. Yeah, he's the homeowner association president, so he's probably thinking, "I'll do my due diligence and, and see what the police see, like, see what's going on, and <laughs> all that kind of stuff." And it's like, "Oh no, gun!" Oh, Mister Levins, time, time to be bundled into the back seat by people who are running from the police. Wow. The car had only driven a short distance when it slowed down on Boynton Road. There, the group brandished their weapons and held up a man who'd been hitchhiking. Levinson heard the whole bizarre exchange from his position on the floor, never seeing the holdup victim's face. The man forked over the $29 he had, apologizing that there wasn't more. The group gave him $3 back and sped off. Levinson later recalled hearing the fugitives laughing about the encounter shortly afterward. With a group of alleged cop killers on the loose, Florida police had mobilized every available unit both on the ground and in the air, using helicopters to search. The whole thing came to a head at a roadblock at the intersection of Boynton Road and Military Trail. A police blockade had been established using commandeered semi-tractor trailers to block the road. The caddy, by now pursued by other officers, sped toward the roadblock and crashed into one of the trucks, unsuccessful at breaking through. Apparently, as the suspects emerged from the car, they still had their guns, and police began firing at them. Rhodes was wounded in the leg and surrendered. Teferro, Jacobs, and the children surrendered as well, relatively unscathed. Leonard Levinson was pulled from the car with a leg injury that required a brief hospital visit. The children were quickly placed into custody with Florida's Child Protective Services. Their parents and Rhodes were arrested. Jacobs and Teferro were taken to the Palm Beach Sheriff's Station in Delray Beach for booking and Rhodes was whisked off to the hospital where his gunshot wound was treated while he was under heavy guard. The couple were booked on two counts of murder each, plus two counts of robbery and one of grand larceny. They were held without bond. It had been two years since any other officer had been killed on duty in Broward County and the first time ever a Canadian off-duty officer had been murdered there. People screamed for justice. Of course they did and they would. And also, I mean, you've probably seen this in the news, Mike, when, when visitors get killed at, in tourist destinations, mm -hmm. authorities really pull out all the stops because uh, they want tourists to think that um, it's a still a safe place to visit. Right, because it's a big part of the economy. Yeah. yeah. I talked about that in one of the cases in my book yeah. about a cross-border murder. Oh, so. that's where I read it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's happened more than once. I keep quoting, like, I read somewhere, and it makes like that was from my book. <laughs> that's Yeah, that's in my book. But yeah, especially... If the visitor is an off-duty police officer, like if you look at it, it's probably one of the worst things that could happen to a touristy community is an off-duty yeah. police officer is murdered. But it, it's also so 70s. Mm -hmm. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> he didn't have a vest or anything. You know, we, you know, when we were kids in the 70s, we'd pile in the back of the station wagon. Mm -hmm. like, Safety was less of an issue in 1972 than it is now. Yeah, well, 76. But anyway. 76, sorry. But there were, I remember station wagons in the back of Mums. There were like little places where you could keep things in the back of the station wagon along the walls. And yeah. we had melted crayons in there. Oh, uh -huh, the because famous. Ra melt. Rachel and I would sit in the back and color. The famous melted crayons. Yeah. <laughs> While in hospital, 
it was discovered that Walter Rusty Rhodes' injury to his left leg was so serious, it required the limb to be amputated below the knee. He's required a prosthetic ever since, a hard reminder of his involvement in this crime. Right away, Rhodes began making statements that it was Jacobs and Teferro who'd killed Black and Irwin, not him. Rhodes was very willing to make a deal that would save his skin and take down Jesse Teferro and Sonny Jacob. We'll hear more about this story after a quick break. But first, here's a promo for a podcast that we think you might like. It's called Podcast by Proxy, and we met the hosts, Katie and Olivia, at CrimeCon this year. Have a listen. Hi, friends. I'm Olivia. And I'm Katie. We are Podcast by Proxy, a Canadian true crime podcast. Our primary focus is Canadian cases, but sometimes we travel south of the border and love listener suggestions. Join us every Tuesday where we talk about some of the not-so-polite Canadians. You can find us at Podcast by Proxy wherever you listen to your podcasts and on all social media platforms. So his employer eventually finds out about his criminal past, though, and releases him from employment. He gets a job selling hot dogs on Main Street for a while before he lands a permanent job as a salad maker for G&G Foods, and he worked, like, late overnights at this job. So this guy literally tossed salads for a living. Correct. Okay. A murderous (laughs) salad tosser. (laughs) Oh, lordy. It's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts on this story so far? This is one of the craziest stories. Mm -hmm. You have an entire family that's going from a Camaro. You know, they're all there. The two police officers are killed. They're Mm -hmm. in a Camaro. Then they're all in a stolen police car. And then they're all in poor Mr. Levinson's Cadillac. Yeah, his orange caddy. It's just insanity. And he was probably, you know, well, it is. And he was probably really proud of that car. You know, like, of course he was. I Mr. remember Levinson saved all of his life and he moved down. He probably from New York, moved down to New York South in Miami. Right. Yeah. In a nice retirement home, got a caddy, just enjoying his, 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 not his wilderness years, his twilight years. Mm-hmm. Yikes. Donald R. Irwin's family flew home with his body and a funeral was held in Kitchener for the beloved fallen police corporal. Some 500 people, more than 300 of them police officers, including OPP Brass and a representative from the Florida Highway Patrol, attended the service for Irwin. Back in Coral Springs, Florida, the Blacks family service for Philip was also hugely attended by fellow law enforcement. A colleague of Donald Irwin spoke to the Fort Lauderdale News about the corporal. Quote, He covered the 611 miles of roads here real well, said Constable Barry Rule, who worked with Irwin out of Kitchener, Ontario. If he saw a car stalled along the side of the road, he would always stop and help, and he was very cautious if a situation looked dangerous. Rule said Kitchener, a town of 120,000, and the surrounding farmlands are peaceful, and shooting is rare. You just don't see that much action here, he said. Irwin was also liaison officer between the provincial police and its 35-man auxiliary force. 
The auxiliary force was seen as the best in Ontario, and a good part of that was due to Corporal Irwin's diligence. There were similar sentiments echoed about Black. He was known to follow up on cases, even long after the fact. A month prior to being gunned down, Philip Black had gone to the state attorney's office to make sure charges were filed in a traffic death because he had arrested the driver in a twin fatality crash two years before. He was angered that the driver was again behind the wheel of a car. The three adults involved in the shooting pointed their fingers at the others. Teferro said it had been Rhodes, while Rhodes claimed it was Jacobs and Teferro who'd shot the officers. Jacobs was claiming she'd not seen who pulled the trigger, but felt it could not have been her common-law husband, Jesse Teferro, so it had to have been Rhodes. What turned out to be the murder weapon was found in the waistband of Jesse Teferro's pants during his arrest. Ballistics proved that this was the gun that had killed both officers. It also matched a bullet found in the windshield post of Black's cruiser, indicating that the shooter had fired from behind the Camaro. You know that old saying, there's no honor amongst these? Yeah. <laughs> we often see this. A lot of people in a situation, everyone's pointing at each other immediately. Well, see, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody's pointing at each other, but one of them had to have done it. Yeah, absolutely. One or more than one or, yeah. yeah. At the scenes of the murders and capture, police gathered evidence, including firearms and drugs. From the Palm Beach Post-Times, at the scene of the murders, police found, quote, a small bag filled with what appeared to be marijuana and handguns, as well as a 38 caliber pistol. Police said a briefcase containing small quantities of marijuana, hashish, and amphetamines, as well as other drugs not yet analyzed by police laboratories, were also found. The guns were all registered to Sonny Jacobs, the only non-felon who'd been in the car. The two men were barred from legally owning firearms thanks to their past criminal convictions, which were extensive. In 1969, Walter Norman Rhodes Jr. had been convicted of two counts of felony aggravated assault in Miami-Dade County and was subsequently sentenced to seven years and six months behind bars. At the time of the murders, Teferro was also on parole. His crimes included attempted rape and holding two women hostage in 1967. Regarding the murders of Black and Irwin, Rhodes turned state's evidence and in exchange for his own life testified against Jacobs and Teferro in separate trials. In both cases, Rhodes dramatically hobbled into court to testify on his newly fitted prosthetic leg. From court documents, quote, Rhodes testified that when Black took the gun from the Camaro, Teferro passed another gun to Jacobs in the back seat. Black ordered everyone out of the car, and as Black assisted Teferro from the car, the two began to scuffle. Rhodes, with his back to the scuffle, then heard two shots which sounded as if they were fired from different guns. He turned and saw Jacobs holding a gun, which Teferro then grabbed and fired at Black and Irwin, who fell to the ground. End quote. Ellis Marlowe Haskew testified at Jesse's trial that he had heard Teferro say at a New Year's Eve party five weeks before the murders that he would never go back to prison and that he owned a lot of guns. At Sonny's trial, Trooper Ronald Trice testified about Sonia's post-arrest behavior and a conversation he claimed had taken place between he and Sonia Jacobs immediately after she'd been taken into custody. Ultimately, what she'd said in the police and prosecution's minds, at least, amounted to a confession of involvement in the crime. According to the Charlotte Observer newspaper, quote, Trice said he was leading Jacobs from the stopped car, still unsure if she was a hostage or a suspect, when she pulled away from him to kneel over handcuffed Jesse Joseph Teferro and kiss him. I asked her if she was with them or if she was a hostage, the trooper said, and she said, I'm with them. Trice then said he asked Sonia if she liked shooting the troopers, and she replied, according to Trice, we had to. Defense attorney Ray Sandstrom, on cross-examination, hammered at the point that Trice hadn't reported the conversation in his original statement, end quote. Sonia took the stand in her own defense. While testifying, she said that she'd seen a Florida state trooper that she couldn't identify, bashed Jesse Teferro in the head with the butt end of a shotgun as he was being cuffed. She'd knelt over him to see if he was okay. She also said that she agreed 
she was with Teferro and Rhodes because she'd just gotten out of the car with them. She vehemently denied that the we had to portion of the conversation ever happened. The prosecution also presented the testimony of a jailhouse informant, Brenda Isham, who claimed Sonia Jacobs had confessed. Isham was released from jail in exchange for her testimony. Both Teferro and Jacobs were convicted of the first-degree murders of both officers, and they were subsequently both sentenced to die. Even though Sonia's jury had recommended a life sentence, Judge Futch, known to be a tough nut, had overridden that recommendation. The judge found that the killings were done to avoid arrest so that Teferro and Rhodes, who were both on parole, would not be returned to prison. Questions, of course, arose about Rhodes and his plainly questionable and self-serving motives for his testimony against Jacobs and Teferro. Witnesses reporting to hear the apparent difference in sounds of the gunfire, for example, was printed in the paper the day after the murders. Rhodes could have easily gotten that information from news reports and adjusted his testimony to fit what others had said. Interestingly, Rhodes himself later recanted his testimony on three occasions, in 1977, 79, and 1982, stating that he shot the policeman. But ultimately, he reverted back to his original testimony that it was Jacobs and Teferro who'd shot Irwin and Black. In Rhodes' 1982 recantation, he swore under oath that he moved from the front of the car to the back of the car and fired at the two cops. This explained the discrepancies in position of the shooter as seen in the ballistic evidence. However, prosecutors believed they had the right people in prison and more or less ignored Rhodes' testimonial flip-flops. There were also issues with the findings of the gunpowder test done on Walter Rhodes, Jesse Teferro, and Sonia Jacobs. Walter Rhodes, gunpowder residue found consistent with having discharged a weapon. Jesse Teferro, gunpowder residue found consistent with handling an unclean or recently discharged weapon or possibly discharging a weapon. Sonia Jacobs, residue found consistent with having handled an unclean or recently discharged weapon. Jacob's nine-year-old son had the same result as she did. It didn't really make sense that anyone but Rhodes had been the shooter. Teferro always maintained his innocence, and his post-conviction lawyers went to work. They said that mitigating factors in the case were that the penalty phase consisted of a 30-second argument by defense counsel who said the defendant feels he did not receive a fair trial. The verdict is not fair, and he will not beg for his life or ask for mercy. Huh? They also claimed that the judge failed to instruct the jury that Jesse could have been convicted on second-degree murder if they found the evidence insufficient and that he may not have been the actual cause of the officer's deaths. As well, the prosecutor had come up with a jailhouse informant named as a witness on the first day of Jesse's trial. They hadn't informed the defense that this was going to happen. The prosecutors had failed to divulge facts to the defense about the witness's career as a snitch which was extensive. Jesse's defense counsel asked for a continuance to investigate the witness's background and claims Judge Futch denied the request. They only had 30 minutes to interview the man before his testimony. Yeah, this is, this is also difficult, you know? Mm -hmm. Because sort of these details, like, I immediately go to the place of you were, you were all there mm -hmm. in a car yep. with guns yep. and drugs. Yeah. And all of that stuff. Guns and drugs are one thing. Yeah. Shooting police officers is another thing entirely. But I've been in cars with all of those things and we've yeah. not had to shoot police officers. No, I know, but I'm just, oh gosh, it was just all asking for trouble. With all his appeals exhausted, Jesse Joseph Teferro's date with Old Sparky came on May 4th, 1990. That's the same chair that Ted Bundy had been executed in just over a year prior. Teferro's execution did not go well. On the day of, Teferro met with his mother and a Roman Catholic priest celebrated Mass with him. Teferro then placed a phone call to Sonia Jacobs before being taken to the waiting electric chair. Witness to Teferro's execution, author Ellen McGarahan wrote in her book Two Truths and a Lie about what she'd seen. Quote, when the electricity hit Jesse Teferro, the headset bolted onto his bare scalp, caught fire, 
Flames blazed from his head, arcing bright orange with tails of dark smoke. A gigantic buzzing sound filled the chamber, so deep I felt it inside the bones of my spine. In the chair, Jesse Tafaro clenched his fists as he slammed upward and back. He is breathing, I wrote on my yellow notepad. The executioner, anonymous in the booth, turned the power off. Jesse in the chair, nodding, breathing, his chest heaving. Then the buzzing again, flames, smoke. His head nods, his head is nodding, he is breathing. My prison-issued pencil dug into the page so hard that the paper ripped. I can see him sigh. End quote. According to deathpenaltyinfo.org, quote, state officials claim that the botched execution was caused by inadvertent human error, the inappropriate substitution of a synthetic sponge for a natural sponge that had been used in previous executions. The whole affair had taken an excruciating seven minutes. Senator Larry Plummer, a Miami funeral director, was, was disgusted. He said, quote, If what we're trying to do is take the barbarians out of society, do we too have to show that we're barbarians? Why don't we just cut off their heads like Genghis Khan and play polo with them? End quote. It has been rumored that Tafaro's death served as inspiration for author Stephen King when he wrote the execution of Edward Delacroix in his novel The Green Mile. After Teferos botched execution, Florida used for the next 16 executions at least a consistent preparation of the sponges to make electrocutions go more smoothly. But in 1997, convicted murderer Pedro Medina's electrocution was also a horror show. From deathpenaltyinfo.org, quote, A crown of foot-high flames shot from the headpiece during the execution filling the execution chamber with a stench of thick smoke and gagging the two dozen official witnesses. An official then threw a switch to manually cut off the power and prematurely end the two-minute cycle of 2,000 volts. Medina's chest continued to heave until the flames stopped and death came. After the execution, prison officials blamed the fire on a corroded copper screen in the headpiece of the electric chair, but two experts, hired by the governor, later concluded that the fire was caused by the improper application of a sponge designed to conduct electricity to Medina's head, just like in Teferro's botched execution. So I don't support state-sanctioned murder. Right. And in my mind, that's what executing prisoners is. Mm -hmm. And some people that do will say, oh, this is botched and we're horrible. It was horrible. Others will actually celebrate the fact that this happened, unfortunately. Yep, they did. Right? But, yep. but for me, I just don't buy all at all into like a culture of vengeance, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's just completely the antithesis. Well, even, you know, it, it, it's interesting that this happens in, in states with Christian right-wing leanings. Right. And they say, you know, it's... It's the will of God. Well, it actually isn't. It's the will of man. That's right. Sonny's story is a little different. As there was no death row for women, she spent years in solitary confinement, away from the rest of the prison population. Oh, that's really interesting. Why is there no death row for women? Mike? Because there were no women on death row. Oh, so... She was it. Really? Okay. Yeah. So it, you know, they don't have a specific place for them because... There aren't any. So educate me here. Mm. Death row literally meet like it's literally a specific area where they're kept. That's correct. Oh, I thought it was just you're in the lineup of numbers and you're in with the general population. No, you're away from the general population uh, for reasons like they want to watch you because um, they don't want you a killed by other prisoners because a lot of people who are on death row are there for reasons that particularly other, horrible things yeah other prisoners may want to do them in for right or they may want to do themselves in yeah. and the state is reserving the right to to do it to do I, it i did not know that i mm -hmm. thought it just meant like you're in the row of numbers no like um no. <laughs> solitary confinement for that long must um that must be hard as well it definitely and and she gets into how she dealt with it okay from the Northwestern University Law Department's article on Sonia Jacobs' case, quote, In 1978, 
the Florida Supreme Court temporarily relinquished jurisdiction of Jacob's case, directing Futch to hold a hearing on whether the Broward County State Attorney had improperly withheld exculpatory evidence during the pretrial discovery, including reports stating that Rhodes had told a prison guard that he alone shot the officers and that he had given answers during a polygraph test that were inconsistent with his trial testimony. Judge Futch found no merit in Jacob's claims, saying that Rhodes' purported statement to the prison guard had been equivocal and that it was impossible to establish precisely what Rhodes had said during the polygraph examination because there was no verbatim script of the questions and answers. The results of the polygraph itself, which Rhodes failed, had been properly withheld because, as a matter of law, polygraph results were not discoverable. End quote. But after another appeal in 1981, Sonny's death sentence was overturned, and she was sentenced to life with a 25-year minimum mandatory sentence. In the 11th Circuit Court's opinion overturning her conviction, the court found both alleged confessions ludicrous based on the circumstances, but threw out only one on Miranda grounds as she had not been read her rights at that point. The Florida Supreme Court agreed that the discovery issues did not warrant a new trial, affirming Jacob's conviction. However, the court commuted her sentence to life in prison, holding that Futch had lacked sufficient basis to override the jury's recommendation of a life sentence. The jailhouse informant, Brenda Isham, who testified against Sonia, recanted her testimony and went on national television to apologize to Sonia Jacobs. She claimed that the district attorney knew she was lying, but didn't care as to her. He seemed interested only in convicting Jacobs. Shortly before Teferro's execution, filmmaker Mickey Dickoff had initiated correspondence with Jacobs. The two had been childhood friends growing up in Indiana. Dickoff soon became persuaded of Jacobs' innocence and obtained affidavits used to supplement a pending habeas corpus petition which the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit granted in February of 1992. Three polygraph experts confirmed that Rhodes did not pass the polygraph he'd taken before the trials of Teferro and Jacobs, and one said it was the most botched test he'd ever seen. A Brady violation in Jacobs' case reversed her conviction because the prosecutor failed to turn over the summary report of the polygraph to Sonia's counsel before her trial. The following October, the Broward County State Attorney offered to release Jacobs if she would enter a plea in which she did not admit guilt. An Alford plea, also known as a best interests plea, registers a formal claim neither of guilt nor innocence toward charges brought against a defendant in criminal court. An Alford plea arrests the full process of criminal trial because the defendant, typically only with the court's permission, accepts all the ramifications of a guilty verdict, i.e. the punishment, without first attesting to having committed the crime. Complicated, but yes, that's what happened. Facing a retrial and possibly another death sentence, Sonia took the plea deal and was released on time served. Dickoff made a docudrama on the case entitled In the Blink of an Eye, which aired as an ABC movie of the week in 1996. Sonia later married a man who'd also spent 15 years on death row, but his was in Ireland. She has done a TED Talk and speaks regularly about how she maintained her sanity under first a death sentence in solitary confinement and then in general population after her sentence was commuted to life. Sonia told Prison-Insider.com, quote, I had all the time in the world to myself. In the end, I decided that my life still belonged to me. I believed in hope rather than hopelessness. I needed to repair my relationship with God. I had begun to doubt he even existed because of what had happened to us. If there is going to be hope, there needs to be God. I made a routine for myself every day. I took charge of my life. The time that I had was still my own, and I turned my cell into a sanctuary. It was an interesting time. In a way, I found a freedom inside my cell. I learned that you always have a choice. I chose to find some joy in my life even there. Making plans for when I would be let out really helped. Every night with meditation, I used to send my energy to Jesse and to my children and to kiss them goodnight. 
I found something inside myself that set me free. Even when my sentence was commuted from death to life, I kept those practices. Meditation, yoga, and prayer became my trinity. I still do that to this day. Five years after I was released, I got hit by a car. I thought, is this a joke? This isn't supposed to happen to me. Being constrained by my mobility somehow made me a more compassionate and understanding yoga teacher for people who couldn't move very well. This accident has not impacted my freedom. My mind is still free. Sonny also claims that forgiveness is what sets you free. Also from prison-insider.com. Quote, Forgiveness is one of the first things we talked about with Peter, my husband. The definition is tricky. What is forgiveness? Does it mean it's all right for them to do what they did? Of course not. But it's not about them because they don't even realize or care about what they did to you. It's about you. It's what sets you free. Forgiveness for me was being willing to let go of all those feelings of resentment, hatred, and to replace it with joy, happiness, and health. That's a great trade, but it's still a process. The hardest part was that I had to forgive myself. Sometimes, even just a song will bring it all back, and you have to forgive again. My children still have problems to this day that I know have come from my time in prison. When I hear about how prison in general affects children, I have to work on forgiving once again. That makes me angry and sad. My way of dealing with that is by working actively against the death penalty to change the unjust laws and to help people who have been affected by those laws. End quote. You know, I'm, I'm not against people learning from their mistakes. And it sounds like, you know, she was in a situation that she probably shouldn't have put herself and her kids in at the time. She admits that she made yeah. a lot of mistakes in her life. Yeah. So she's not saying she was an angelic person who was just in the wrong no. place. No, I believe in redemption and I believe in moving forward. I, just, I hope in the midst of self-forgiveness and worried, worrying about her children, that somewhere along the line there was... Um, a place in her head for the victims and the, the victim's kids and what they went through for, as well. So right? for everything that I have read about her, she seems to be the a type of person. I, I watched some videos of her. She mm. seems to be now the type of person who would be thinking about that Good. kind of thing. Good. Just because I didn't mention it here yeah. um, just means that I didn't dig into it that far. So Yeah, and I think this story goes to show, right, like, just because somebody's been in a situation and yes, two police officers are killed, she didn't pull the trigger, right? Mm -hmm. All of that stuff. It doesn't mean you write them off as human beings. No. No, absolutely not. And a lot of people want to do that. Uh, people will write you off as a human being for... Uh, uh, anything. <laughs> for pretty much anything these yeah. days. Yeah. You see people make a single mistake and they're canceled. Yeah. But maybe that person is contrite for that mistake and is willing to learn from it. Yeah. I've and, made lots of mistakes. And Mike, she spent 18 years in prison. Right? right. Yeah. And she didn't pull the trigger. And if you think of the Canadian justice system, when people actually are accused of murder and sometimes get out in 10, 15 yeah, years. Even less. You know, it's not like she didn't pay her debt. Yeah, she did actually pay her right. debt for her participation in that situation. And she's learned from it. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Sonia and her husband now run the Sunny Center, which can be found online at sunnycenter.org. That center spelled C-E-N-T-E-R. The Sunny Center Foundation is a nonprofit organization that helps people who have suffered the injustice of wrongful conviction, giving them support after they've been exonerated and released from prison. In 2012, they began welcoming exonerees into their home, in 2014, the foundation was established and they were able to extend their assistance more broadly using a unique, holistic approach encompassing physical, mental and spiritual healing and ongoing support at the Sunny Healing Retreat Center in Ireland. In 2018, they opened the Sunny Living Center, a housing complex in Tampa, Florida for exonerees. In 2020, their mission expanded to helping families and others who've been affected by the injustice of wrongful conviction, as well as extending their healing techniques to the general public. Well, what became of Rhodes, you ask? He was paroled in 1994. After serving 18 years, 
Although still under a life sentence, he was supposed to report to a parole officer regularly, but absconded shortly after his release. He was not taken into custody again until 2003. From the Seattle Times, quote, The case had gone cold when Florida Highway Patrol Lieutenant Paul Henry, an identity theft specialist, saw Walter Rhodes' name on the Florida Highway Patrol website and on a whim ran it through some public records databases. It popped up next to a post office in Twisp, Washington. Henry started connecting the dots. The post office box connected to Sarah Estes' name. Marriage records connected her to a Michael Estes. A look at Michael Estes' Washington driver's license showed the same physical description as Walter Rhodes. Henry asked for a driver's license photo, and although there was an 18-year difference between that photograph and the Florida Department of Corrections photo, authorities were sure that they had a match. I requested the driver's license application, Henry said, and Washington requires the applicant to list impairments to driving. And there it was artificial leg. About 2.45 p.m. on September 9, 2003, Okanagan County Sheriff's deputies working on Henry's tip followed Rhodes as he drove from his house, pulled him over, and arrested him for investigation of identity theft, perjury, and possession of a firearm. His wife was arrested for harboring a fugitive. End quote. 53-year-old Rhodes was taken into custody less than 10 kilometers from the Canadian border. None of his neighbors in Washington knew anything about the man who lived next door. After extradition hearings, Rhodes was returned to Florida and back to prison, where his parole violation will most likely keep him for the remainder of his days. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 223, Blurred Justice, The Murders of Corporal Irwin and Trooper Black. That's right, it's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1 877 327 5786 or 1 877 DARK PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Here's our first voicemail. Hi, guys. It's Lori. I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed today's show, especially because, Matthew, I am going to be in London in two weeks because I have to. And I know you were there recently. So if you did not, I I would volunteer to go to the Grand Theater and take a photo of the <laughs> proscenium arch that is above the stage, um, which, or you could just Google it like I did and look very closely at it. If you do, you'll see an oval shape in the middle at the top of the arch. It could be a hole, just like the perineum. The perineum has one hole at the back and depending on who you are, a couple of holes at the front. <laughs> so, from now on in, I am going to get proscenium arch mixed up with perineum as well. I really love you guys, and I will be listening until the day I die. There's, Bye. After all of that, what I find hilarious is she said she's going to London because she has to. <laughs> I'm I'm guessing she's from Toronto. Yeah, this was <laughs> yeah. Let's just say I had Thank to edit you, I had to edit that voicemail a lot. Thank you, Lori. You you were cracking me up. Oh boy. <laughs> Let's move on to our next one. Hi, Mike and Matthew. My name is Maria. I'm calling because recently you got a voicemail from someone on their wedding day. And you said it would be cool to receive more voicemails from people on important dates. Well, today was my university graduation. I meant to call from the event, but it was really, really hectic, so I didn't get a chance. <laughs> I'm calling from home, but I hope it still counts, and you can cross that off your list. Uh, it was a really nice event. I was surprised that I graduated cum laude, so that was really exciting. So the sweet people are doing that. Thank you for keeping me company these past few years while I commuted to and from school. I owe you some part of my success. You do such an amazing job, and I've been listening since pretty much the beginning. I'm a huge fan. Anyway, say hello to Stephen Carroll for me, and go take a shit in your hat. Bye. Wow. Thanks, Maria. Very nice. Congratulations on your graduation. Yes. Congrats. Come loud even. What like. Does, what does that mean? It means it's like with distinction. 
You did super well. You did. You done good. You done good, Maria. Yeah. That's awesome. You, uh, now I'm now I have that Blondie song in my head. What's that? Maria. Oh yeah, that's a good song. Such too. a good song, Maria. If you don't know that song by Blondie uh, or by Debbie Harry, check it out. It's really good. There you go. Uh, let's listen to another voicemail. Uh, hi there. My name's April, and I'm from a town in Ontario called London. Um, I just started listening to your show maybe a few weeks ago, and I am already hooked on it. It's actually referenced uh, to me from a guy that I met at the gym. Um, really enjoying it. Love you guys. Love everything that you guys talk about. I find your show to be so respectful, and it's kind of like a safe space. So thank you for creating that. Um, I do have a request. I don't know if you've already done this. Please disregard. I tried to go through your previous episodes, but... I might have missed it. Um, London, Ontario is the um, murder capital of the world. Um, there's a lot of books coming out about it. Um, one that I really enjoyed was by uh, Michael Arfield, and he's a criminology professor at our local uh, Western University. And his book's called Murder City. And he believed that we had up to six serial killers operating at one time from 1960 to 1985 which is what made us the murder capital of the world. And there's another one, too, by another local author. I don't know her background. I do know that she runs a small bookstore in our downtown. Um, but her book's called The Forest City Killer, also a really good book full of interviews from the officers that were working the murders back then. Um, I'd really love it if you guys could make an episode about it. Um, I find criminology to be very interesting and I feel like a lot of people don't know about Little London, Ontario and why we are the murder capital of the world. So I think it'd be really cool if you guys did an episode about it. Um, yeah. So thanks so much for producing such an awesome podcast and take a shit in your hat. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, April. <laughs> so yeah, actually I've read both of those books. Yeah. Because I gave them to you. <laughs> you gave me one. I gave you one. The yeah. other one I bought. So it would technically London it wasn't the murder capital, murder capital of the world. It was the serial killer capital of the world mm -hmm. um, and for about 20 years. And actually, and it's funny because London being London, like takes claim to everything. I actually listen to the episode called The Mad Slasher of Strathroy because that was grouped in, but he was from my hometown of Strathroy. Yeah, Matthew's not from London. <laughs> Matthew is from London, so and um yeah, so yeah, both of the, the books uh, are really good. And actually I meant to go to that bookstore last time I was in town. I cannot remember the author's name. Um, but I'm gonna go there next time. And also I want to know if you were born in April or if your parents just really liked the name because it'd be weird if you're born in may that's it for this week's voicemails again you can leave us one at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARKPTN we'd love to hear from you even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats if you're stumped for what to chat with us about a quick story is welcome it is time for patreon and donut money donor shout outs uh, yeah, we had a few this week, which is really nice. First up, though, Darren McDonald, friend of the show, long time, has upped his pledge. Much appreciated. Things are getting a little skinny on, on Patreon. They really were, so thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, thank you so much, Darren. Much appreciated. We, we, and, we, we really do rely on Patreon. Money, yeah. And it, it's, it's hard to see you suffering when it's gone down. Well, you know, everybody's suffering right now. So I why am. shouldn't I? Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, but it's, it's like, uh, it's like you said, if everybody who was say in the Yumber Yard did like a dollar, a dollar a month, we'd be like, yeah, we'd be okay. In good shape. Yeah. Right? So Darren, we've talked about Darren before and where he's from, but I think he's moved. Where has Darren moved to? Hump Tulips, Washington. Hump <laughs> There's, I've been to Tulalip. <laughs> this is called Hump Tulips. Well, I don't know if anybody's humping tulips, and I'm hoping that Darren sees better things to hump than... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of it that way. Get your mind out of the gutter. Hump Tulip. Hump Tulips. Okay. I just thought it sounded funny. Yeah, it is and funny. And you, of course, took it to the gutter. So what does Darren do in Hump Tulip? <laughs> Besides some tulips. Greenhouse. Well, there you go. Yeah. 
Yeah, there are a lot of really beautiful tulips. In yeah, there. they're in uh, Dutch uh, heritage. Oh, there you go. Yeah. McDonald. Yeah. That's very Dutch. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Next, we have, oh, look, it is another person with the last name McDonald, and her name rhymes with Darren's. It's Karen. Are Karen and Darren married? I don't know. Karen and Darren, but... Karen, maybe... meet Darren. Darren, well, meet Karen. Yeah, exactly. So Karen McDonald. So Karen is from Petawawa, Ontario. Petawawa. Petawawa, and that's the place with a big base, if I remember correctly. I believe so. A, a Canadian Forces base. And what does Karen McDonald do in Petawawa? I, I think she's um, Air Force. Oh, she's Air Force. Yeah. Does she fly? Of course she does. Oh, cool. So Karen's the pilot of, what, CF-18? Pew, pew, pew. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Someone's got to do it. Uh, I, That'd be so cool. I'd be good flying, but yeah. I, don't, I don't think I'd be good actually as a passenger because I'm a control freak. <laughs> well, I flew once. I, I didn't like it. Oh, you didn't like it? No. no. Like on a stunt plane? No, I took one lesson. Oh. And hated it. It was scary. Yeah. Next, we have Sarah. I don't know where Sarah is from. She's like Cher with only one name, Sarah. P.P. Township, Ohio. <laughs> P.P. Township. Yeah. <laughs> We're 14-year-old boys. Um. <laughs> so what does Sarah do in P.P. Township? <laughs> she, she works at a chicken and shake shop. Oh, cool. Yeah. Hey, have you ever had chicken and waffles? I have. There's really good chicken and waffles downtown. I can't even remember the restaurant Ricky's. right now, which is terrible. No, it's a different, it's a nice restaurant. I'd never heard of it until I moved to Vancouver. Is it a Vancouver thing? No, it's an America thing. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I was like, what? Chicken and waffles? I like both. Yeah, it is very, very good. Yeah, this is a new discovery of mine. Chicken and waffles. So do you eat chicken and waffles? Well... My diet hasn't been going so well. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, let me know if you want food, because we'll do food. <sighs> Just lie and say, you know, you're on your diet, but you want a lot of food. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, we have somebody from Prague in the Czech Republic. I think... For real? This is for real. Her name is Petra Chudobova. Hi, Petra. Yeah, so Petra Chudobova is from Prague, Czech Republic. I so want to go to Prague. That is one of my bucket list places because I want to go to the Sedlec mm -hmm. ossuary. Okay. You know, the uh, mm -hmm. the church that has like the chandeliers yep. made of bones and all that kind of stuff. Have yeah. you been there? Um, actually, Prague has a had a great film industry in, during the Soviet Union. Um, so after um, the collapse of the, of the Union and more freedom in Prague, mm -hmm. after they were stomped down for a while there, yeah, um, a lot of really good people who can um, do film production. So I've shot many TV commercials in Prague. Yeah, a lot of folks who I know in the film industry have mm -hmm. been to Prague to shoot to shoot uh yeah movies yeah yeah i mean it's it's um you get good value and, and really like quality people that know what they're doing in Prague. yeah very cool and uh so what does petra do does she work in the movies matthew she she is she does what does she do in the film industry in she's, Prague? she's she's a producer oh cool yeah yeah I, if there's any job that you want to do, it's uh, someone who's above the line. Yep. And <laughs> because the below the line is the stuff that I had done before, and I uh, I would rather not. Petra makes it all happen. Good for Petra. And be nice to the people who are below the line is all I ask. I'm sure she does. Yeah. If you don't do that, you're not going to have a good show in the end. It's true. Yeah. Next up, we have someone else with only one name, and it's Chantal. Chantal. And, and Chantal, I don't know where she's from. You don't know where Chantal's from? No. Well, I think this might be Chantal. He used to be my assistant, and I think she lives in London. London, England? Yes. Oh, okay. She was your assistant? Yeah. Um, what did she assist you with? What do you need assistance with? She literally, like, passed me an envelope with all the paperwork in it and tell me where I'm going and open the door to the car and send me off to the airport. Oh, and that's then, nice. And then answer my phone when I got lost in foreign climbs. Well, there you go. So is she still assisting people? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but Chantel's dad was this, like, kooky, cool artist. 
cool. He did like this um, performance art wearing garbage bags and stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Next, we have Mel Laos. Mel Laos. And uh, looks like the first name is actually Malardo. So I believe that Mel is a he. Okay. Yeah. So what does Mel do? And where is he from? And where is he from? He's Well, he was born Mel, so he's from Melbourne. Melbourne, yeah, okay, he's, in he's Austria. Me, he's Mel Melbourne, he's, is he a nice fella? He's Melbourne. <laughs> he's Melbourne, oh dear. <laughs> and what? And what's he do? Is he, is he still living in Australia? Well, Melbourne is like Prague is for TV production. Um, Melbourne actually is quite the center for arts and graphic art, so he's a graphic artist. A graphic fartist. Yes. I used to be a graphic fartist as well. Did you? Were you any good at it? Yeah, I was pretty good at it. Really? Yeah. Oh. I did okay. Okay. Why? I'm just judging from your decor. <laughs> <laughs> Go shit in your mouth. <laughs> you know, I'm kidding, buddy. Yeah. So, a graphic fartist. Well, that's very cool. Next, let's see if we had any donut money donors. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. That was much appreciated. He put a smile on Mike's face. Yeah. So our first donut money shout out is Edward McDonnell. Edward McDonnell. And he says, cardams are expensive. <laughs> I am a Canadian living in the U.S. and I enjoy my weekly taste of home via dark poutine. Aww. Been listening weekly since episode five. My binge was short <laughs> and I love you guys. And when I heard you talk last week about patrons canceling, I thought I'm long overdue to make a contribution oh. as I have enjoyed this great podcast for years for free and encourage others who are in a position to do so to do the same. Oh, thank you. Go take a shit emoji in your <laughs> hat emoji. <laughs> and Edward sent a three digit. No. Yeah. Donation. Edward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so I'm much. I'm going to give you a virtual kiss and a hug. Mwah. He doesn't want one from you. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I don't know. What? Oh. Next, we have uh, another Donut Money donor named Mia Belanger. And Mia says, been listening since... Gra oh, well, oh, we forgot what Edward does for a living. Yeah. Well, let's, go, let's go back. Okay. So thank you, Edward. Uh... Kisses from Matthew, obviously. <laughs> and uh, what does Edward do for a living? I think he's a diplomat. Okay. And where does he live? Because I forgot to ask that too. San Francisco. San Francisco. So he's a Canadian diplomat living in the United States. Enjoying that rice aroni. Enjoy. <laughs> it's the San Francisco treat. No, it's San Francisco's favorite treat. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, next up we have... Mia Belanger, and Mia is from Manitowage, Ontario. Manitowage. Okay. And she says, been listening since grade nine, and I'm graduating this month. Figured it's time to pitch in and give Steve a pet for me, please. Aw, that's very nice. Mia, you know how to make Mike feel old. Mia, grade nine. That, I love that. I've been listening since grade nine, that's, and I'm graduating. That's fantastic. Good Lord. Thank you, Mia. Yes, well, thank you and, so and much. Congrats on gradu graduating. Uh, what, Must what? have been a weird couple of last years. Imagine graduating during the whole COVID thing. Yeah, weird, huh? Yeah. Well, I wonder what she's going to do with her life. What is her career path, Matthew? What's her career path? Yes. Well, she wanted, she was going, she did, she's going to take political science. Okay. But then she's going to realize... No, politicians are all generally horrible. Yeah. So she's going to um, do like uh, Doctors Without Borders sort of thing, even though she's not a doctor. So, oh, she's just going to be sort of administration in Doctors Without Borders. She's going to lead it. Well, good for you. Yeah. Good for you, Mia. Yeah. yeah, we don't, you know, aim big. Why not? Yeah, exactly. Why not? Uh, next we have from Emily Matisse Designs. Emily Matisse Designs in Ottawa, Ontario. She clearly designed something. She says, hey, Mike and Matthew, thought you could use a donut or two. Last time I sent money, you guessed that I was a big and tall designer. 
That's not true. I'm a knitter with a small Etsy shop. Oh. So Matisse is spelled. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. Matisse is spelled M I T I S Z. So Emily Matisse. So yeah. Thank Go you, to Emily. Emily's Etsy shop. Where she knits for big and tall. Yeah. <laughs> she says, I do knit adult <laughs> sweaters up to five times. <laughs> Thanks for being awesome. From Emily, Rainbow Donuts. Rainbow Donuts. Yeah. I love when people do the emojis in their, in their messages. So. I don't know how they make them. You just... I type sad face emoji in words. In, in your phone. I know, but it gets all confusing. <laughs> Matthew is not very tech savvy. I'm famously not tech savvy. My my husband actually forces me to get new technology when he thinks it's just becoming embarrassing. Yeah, like you had like an iPhone 8 forever. I don't even know. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it is a, a, an iPhone. Now you have an iPhone 13. And you taught me, like when you asked me what system I'm on, I'm like iPhone. And you're like, no, who gives you a bill? Yeah. And I'm like, oh. I guess that's the TELUS people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, what is this? I don't know. It's an iPhone? That is an iPhone, Matthew. It's the thing that people use to contact you and you ghost them. With. I know, but like this 8, 12, 92, 64, 5G. I grew up with a rotary phone attached to the wall. This is all magic to me. You got, you guys didn't have like a... um, uh, uh, No. No? We had a long cord attached to the wall. Wow. So... Even Blackberries were magic to me. Our cordless phone, the, the antenna was bent. Only rich people had cordless phones. We were not rich people. Yeah, well. We were okay people, but yeah, not we, rich. We didn't have cordless until just before I left. I think my parents like waited to get nice things until after my brother left <laughs> and I left so they wouldn't get ruined. Well, they probably like, should, like bent, yeah. but Like bent aerials that you probably did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I probably sat on it when I was talking to one of my girlfriends or something. I don't know. Anyway, thank you everybody for thank your you so much. donut money donations and your Patreon contributions. We really appreciate it. Oh, help. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, love you folks. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that is it for this episode of Dark Poutine. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Goodbye, good eggs. Goodbye to all you good eggs. And you know what? Goodbye to all the bad apples, because what the heck? You guys probably need a hug, too. You can change. I don't know. <laughs> Some can't. I said to my parents, don't trust her. I wouldn't listen. Every family has a secret. Joy Delaney, mother of four, has gone missing. From the author of Big Little Lies comes a chilling new mystery to W. You were an emotional chaos sinkhole, Amy, and I'm sick of it! Starring Annette Benning. Nobody can Break your heart like your own children. And Sam Neill. She will come back. Here we go. Strap in. Apples never fall. All new Thursdays only on W. Stream on Stack TV.